Good afternoon to you. Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Monday, the 24th of October, 2016. Let's take a look at what's happening with sea surface temperature anomalies for today. Colder than normal here across the equatorial Pacific. Weak La Nina conditions are setting up. Won't be long now, I do believe, until the Climate Prediction Center and NOAA officially declare that we have a La Nina in progress here. The rest of the Pacific cooling off as a whole for the most part as well, especially compared to where we were last year. I'll show you that in a moment. And keep your eye on this little region right here. It's where we have a hurricane in progress in the eastern Pacific, taking advantage of that one area of warmer than normal water temperatures. Gulf of Mexico is still quite a bit warmer than it should be. The only hurricane activity this year in the Gulf was way over here in the eastern side. Nothing over here in the central and western Gulf, so the waters remain completely untapped. And that's you know basically true for most of the Caribbean Sea. We had Earl that came in and, uh, in August and made landfall in Belize. And then, of course, Matthew coming in and turning around this way and running up through here etc. But boy, the temperatures have rebounded overall. Just a few patches of blue in here in the Bahamas. This is the cold wake left from Nicole and the rest of the Atlantic warmer than normal, especially the Northwest Atlantic. And that'll be interesting as we get into the winter storm season. Very warm water and the temperature contrasts that are certainly going to be coming uh, over the continent. Cold air clashing with that very warm, unstable air over the Atlantic could make for some powerful nor'easters later on in the winter and then you know, we'll see if this holds on to next hurricane season. Now let me show you what it looked like a year ago. Look at that contrast. That is truly amazing. Is it any wonder why the end of 2015 and all of 2016 has seen above normal temperatures globally? The ocean is like a big thermostat and this was set several degrees higher than it should be. You know, it's like when you're a kid and you go pump the thermostat up or down and mom and dad get mad at you. Don't touch the thermostat. You're not paying for the electricity bill. <laughs> you know, the, the oceans regulate the Earth's temperature way differently than does the land areas. All right, so when you see this compared to this, you know, there's going to be a lag. So I would have to assume that since this is gone and now has reversed to this that in 2017 we won't be setting as many every month is the warmest month ever record and you know, I don't mean to be I know that sounds uh, you know contrite or whatever towards the climate change crowd but you have to look at things like that oh wow look at that boy the ocean was really warmer than it should be and we're not talking about in just a little area the Pacific is the largest water basin on the earth and most of it was well above normal last year and into early this year and it's no wonder that we had such warm global temperatures now that being said and I'm almost done with my tirade here if this persists this La Nina and the overall cooling of the Pacific and we still have record warm months next year then I'll shut my mouth and I'll say, okay, something else must be going on. But when I see that, you have to go, come on, that has to be part of the reason. Anyhow, looking at the subsurface temperatures, uh, which gives us a peek into the future to some extent. This is updated on the 20th of October. A lot of cold anomalies here in the subsurface again over the eastern two-thirds. Some warm spikes showing up here, kind of like a sandwich of cold in between these two areas of warmth. And we'll see how that all adjusts and evolves over the coming months. One indicator that we can keep an eye on on a weekly basis, and I'll show this more and more as we get into the off-season, especially December through May, is the Southern Oscillation Index, or the SOI values. Uh, basically, when these are positive, like we see over here for the most part, September's average was 13.82, typically when we see it above 5 and 7 on the positive side, that's supportive of La Nina conditions uh, because the pressure pattern is such that the way this works out, positive means La Nina usually, negative and strongly so usually means El Nino. And so you have these swings to the daily calculation down here, and those get calculated into the 30-day and the 90-day respectively. And 
you know, you see how things change from there. So we'll see these dramatic drops and we will see dramatic rises, but I will be keeping my on my eye on basically the 90 day and then the 30 day. And right now, you know, the 90 day is around six, which is pretty solidly in La Nina territory. So we'll see how that evolves over time. All right. So what's happening out there in the Atlantic right now? A big X because there's nothing going on over the next five days. So we'll move over to the Eastern Pacific. Remember, I told you this area off the coast of Mexico. Keep an eye on that. This is what it looks like again right there. Positive anomalies. And look what we have. Hurricane Seymour forming in that warm anomaly area. Small hurricane. Very good banding features. A small, very small central dense overcast. A fancy way of saying a core right there of towering thunderstorms and a circular pattern around the eye. The eye itself only a few miles across. This will be a major hurricane very soon, if not already. And uh, the forecast track away from Mexico, thank goodness, because it was a year ago, roughly, that Patricia made landfall down in this region as an unbelievable powerful hurricane. Uh, also a small compact system in late October. And, of course, today is also the 11-year anniversary of Hurricane Wilma that made landfall in southwest Florida, the last Category 3 or higher to make landfall in the U.S. If you haven't read my blog post about all of that at hurricanetrack.com, make sure you check that out before you turn in for the night. It's pretty lengthy, so you could look at it as your nightly reading assignment. Uh, I go into detail about Wilma and what the scale means, the Saffir-Simpson scale, etc., etc. I won't give you any spoilers. If you haven't read it, check it out. Nevertheless, the forecast for Seymour comes around uh, this high pressure that's sitting out here, trough probably coming in over the west. So it'll turn in towards the Baja, but in a greatly weakened state, probably never make it as a tropical system or even a remnant low. They get sheared apart. The moisture will be advected up into the southwest U.S. with an increase in moisture for that region. Sometimes it's beneficial as long as it's not too much at once. Any chance of anything developing over the next couple of weeks? Well, there's always a shot as long as we're in the season and even outside the season. But November 30th is the official end of the hurricane season from a calendar perspective. And the GFS, remember it was like, whoa, way out here. Well, now it's much less subdued or much more subdued and much less amplified, falling in line with, you guessed it, the ECMWF. Maybe next year I will only show ECMWF stuff. <laughs> I don't know. The GFS has its strong points. It did extremely well at the genesis of Matthew. And if you've been following my updates throughout that saga, you remember it was really, really consistent uh, with that. But it's got flaws, that's for sure. And the Euro having none of this amplification into phases 8 or 1, Instead, it's in the null phase with very little MJO activity anywhere. And it's interesting, with that being said, we have still had tropical cyclones forming around the globe. Uh, and we have one out there now, even though it's in the null phase. Of course, Seymour in the eastern Pacific. A real quick look at the GFS from the 12Z run. And I'm going to speed it up so we get through the next two weeks. Rarely do I show this. But I want to point out that looking at the 5,000 foot level, the vorticity signature, you don't see any blobs form for the most part down here in the tropics anywhere. I have these bowling balls of upper level, low pressure areas around in the subtropics, energy moving across in the westerlies, your ridges building across the southeast, not allowing winter to come in just yet. That's a big old ridge in the east there. Look at that. Way out at about a week's time or so. And then your troughs come and go. Large rotating areas of upper level low pressure coming out of the uh, Hudson Bay. Winter will not be too far behind. Some of that energy will start diving south and east. And it won't be long that we'll be talking about cold and snow. And then we got to keep our eyes on the potential for coastal storms. Yes, I do cover those as well. Cousins to summertime hurricanes, those powerful nor'easters. And I'm telling you, I'm going to show you this one more time. I believe that this very, very warm water compared to normal will mean a very destructive and disruptive winter storm season, whether or not we have three or four or one big one like we did last year at the end of January, we'll have to just wait and see. But that is a lot of fuel 
and we're going to probably have a colder winter than we did last year in the absence of the El Nino and that cold air battling over that very warm water. You folks up there in the northeast, you know what happens. So I'm going to be on top of that just like I would uh, a summertime hurricane or a fall hurricane, all right? Always something going on here. All right, well, that's it for today. As always, thanks for tuning in. I am Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com. I'll be back later in the week with more to talk about then.